Connectionism. Let's, let's try something different. So, so let's say you are convinced that um, the language of thought hypothesis was crazy because of the translation room argument, right? Let's say you were convinced that the mind doesn't work like computers do. It was just the metaphor that was available at the time. And so we got to move to something else. Maybe, maybe the internet. So, and today we're going to talk about connectionism. And um, this is a complete alternative to um, the, the classical view that we were talking about before. I'm just going to try to present it in a relatively quick way. It's an involved thing that's not as intuitive as the classical approach in, in a lot of ways. So we'll see how well I do. Um, we're gonna wrap up with language, which is where connectionism is strongest. Um, and then next lecture, we'll talk about uh, comparing them back and forth. Okay, so We've talked about compute, computational approaches like the physical symbol systems hypothesis and the language of thought hypothesis. Um, computers work in a particular way, like they assess the situation, they, they can affect the, the uh, problem that they're facing, they have a goal, they can assess whether the goal has been reached. Um, if they're inter interrupted, they'll fail. Um, and if the problem is big enough, and really you'll, you'll face this very quickly, heuristics have to be used. Connectionist system is almost the opposite of all of this. So it's not a serial processing system. You can have multiple things processed at the same time. And in fact, that's necessary. Um, there's something called soft constraints rather than hard rules. Um, there's sub-symbolic states, which is going to be an issue for representation. A couple of videos ago, we were talking about what it is to represent something. Um, connectionist systems represent in a strange way, which will be the subject of the next lecture, not this one. So what is a connectionist system? How, do we, how did we get here? What inspired it? Well, the brain inspired it. Um, the way people describe it is it was neurally inspired. But when you look at neurons, there's a wide variety of neurons. Um, they're, they're very uh, particular. Um, and even though we can measure their activation in lots of ways, there's, there's lots of stuff going on in them that might not be uh, helpful in trying to build them uh, cognitive architecture, a meta, an understanding of how the mind works. So let's idealize them a little bit. Um, instead of a, a chemical soup um, where there's constantly electricity going back and forth, reaching some threshold and sometimes firing being interrupted, instead what you've got is math. <laughs> You got a thing, we'll call it a node, that receives some input of some sort. And based on some calculation, it either sends a signal or it doesn't. And that's it. It's just uh, basically an on off switch depending on what input you get. So the idea is humans are cognitive agents. We can think. There's prob probably what's going on is something in our brains. Neurons are things in our brains. Maybe the way that they're structured matters. Hopefully, it's not the chemistry or the biology, although probably those matter in some respect. But let's see how far we can get with the formal version of it. So we have to pay attention to the weights, or, um, all of the inputs how much we weight the particular inputs, and then what we do with that information. Um, so this is, again, it's going to be information processing, again. Um, and, and the thing to note here 
especially for the next lecture is it's going to seem like this is going to be in direct conflict with the computational system. But at an abstract level, this is just um, an implementation or well, this is an uh, this is this might just be an implementation of a computational system. We'll see how much conflict there is in the next section and in, in the next lecture altogether. Um, but first, I need to tell you a little bit more about what connectionism is. So we're going to go through two systems, and I put them here in reverse order uh, of when, how we'll discuss them: supervised and unsupervised. So unsupervised is actually fairly um, straightforward. It's this idea from Donald Hebb where um, as you carve a path, you know, think about this like ants uh, going down a path. The, as one ant does, it just uh, makes some connection arbitrarily. But then um, another ant is wandering by, and it'll run into that path, and it'll keep um, as different paths um, go back and forth, eventually you just keep reinforcing the ones that have been hit again and again. So maybe that's what's happening with neurons as well. Maybe that's what ha what will happen in a computational, in sorry, in a, a connectionist network. Essentially, wiring together and firing together. Um, Think about it like whenever you've had these uh, thoughts that keep recurring, maybe you've, you've made a mistake or you had a bad romantic uh, breakup or something or something sad happens and you keep replaying it again in, your, again in your mind and it's hard for you. It gets harder and harder for you to actually distract yourself, that kind of thing. You're just reinforcing um, connections again and again. Uh, and maybe we do this all the time, right? We, we associate smells and songs with particular times in our lives and locations. You might associate this video with where you are in your room right now or where you're jogging or whatever. I don't know how you're watching this. So frequent communication strengthens connections. S stronger connections increases speed. Speed increases transmission. Etc. So maybe that's going on as well as something else, but it's at least going on in our brains, and, and maybe we should incorporate that into our connectionist systems. So I was focusing on the first part before. When to decide whether um, enough signals have been reached at an, enough of a weight. Um, to release uh, your own, for each node to send off its own um, signal, its own discharge. This is going to seem really abstract, and I'm so sorry. I, I, please just try to keep following. Um, I, I would try to make it more concrete if, if it was possible. So there's many ways that the math could work out, right? Um, either a single synapse hit, uh, is weighted in 100% and, and um, if the node is hit, it will fire, or maybe it's got to build up, or maybe it, once it gets to a certain threshold, it, it works, whatever. There's a variety of ways you can do this. Um, and there's also a variety of ways you can organize nodes. So. I was just imagining, so in the previous um, slide, there was just some connections being made. I wasn't telling you why they were, uh, sorry, this previous slide. We were just connecting various nodes to each other in, a variety, in random ways. I wasn't telling you what was going on. Um, but perhaps we can structure them in a particular way to give us the responses that we need, okay? So one thing to note here is uh, nodes can get, only get inputs and produce outputs. And so sometimes the input might be from the world itself. 
if we're talking about a computer program, it'll be whatever you put into the keyboard or the mouse or whatever. If we're talking about a human mind, it might be your senses. The output might be um, a thought in the case of a mind, or it might be some text or a program running in the case of a computer. That means that there must be a lot of things that are only responding to other parts of connection of systems. We call those hidden units or hidden nodes. And these are the crux of what makes a connection of system important and useful and interesting. Because if, if it was just um, the, your senses producing an output, that could just be a computer program it's these nodes that are gonna make the difference. Um, and the, we'll start exploring that in, in these supervised systems, right? So before in the unsupervised system, it was just systems, it, it was just uh, nodes that happened to, to fire, they would start making stronger connections with each other. But now imagine you actually have, um, you want to assess whether your connectionist system did a good thing or a bad thing. You're trying to program a computer to win at chess and you want it to realize when it has been checkmated. So what you do is more math. And I'm not gonna go into the math just like I didn't go into the math before. You could go deep into this if you wanted to. But the idea is um, there is going to be some way of assessing whether you've succeeded or not, and the way to um, the way to calibrate your connection to system is to set up the weights and thresholds. So the uh, the uh, the W's and the um, X is greater than T in this drawing to calibrate those across all of the nodes in the system. Let me say that again in a different way. We want to be able to assess for, uh, let's say you're trying to learn chess or a computer's trying to learn chess. We want to assess how good we're doing. And so the more you win, um, the more you reinforce the, your, your current behaviors, and the more you lose, you have to adjust how you responded to the previous input and how much it took you to produce an output for every single node. Now, if there's a... Imagine there's the system um, and you've got, you're trying to, uh, trying to separate the blue dots from the red dots. So you can imagine uh, the connection system trying something at random. Just like uh, if you are at this, below this slope, you're red. If you're above it, you're blue. And the, uh, the correction uh, process will tell it, no, 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 that's wrong. You, you messed up quite a bit on the red side and just a little bit on the blue side. So then you change it. Um, and then you messed up mostly on the red side. So you change that until eventually you get the right answer. On a simple um, system, you can, uh, so this is just a, uh, a single straight line, this is a single layer. Um, you're separating the possibilities. But now suppose that you can't draw a straight line between all of the, um, the nodes. I'm trying to be extremely clear here, and, and it's so abstract that I'm worried I'm losing everybody. Okay. So 
if you're just assessing whether the squares are black or white or the pieces are black or white, it's easier than if you're trying to figure out whether the knight can eat the queen or whatnot. So this is where you're going to start having to modify your your responses to your response. So the a network is going to be able to um, understand what is happening in the system and adjust its uh, firing so that for any input it will produce the output after uh, enough corrections. So you calibrated it before this way and now you've taken away some of the um, the red pieces and you're, now you're telling it that it's wrong. And it will keep trying to do straight lines and it will fail, which means that now it realized that eventually the system is gonna realize that what it needs to do is actually um, use multiple rules at the exact same time together to produce a response that will be more complex than a single rule. So each of the nodes will, will say, um, if it is below a certain line, you make it red. If it is above it, you make it blue. Uh, and uh, you'll divide up the world depending on, on how you see it. Let's try to let's try to be as clear as possible here. The more complicated the solution, the more you're going to need to modify the rules. The more soft rules you will need to include. Okay. So. Imagine you're trying to teach a computer to play Go. It's a really complex game, 17 by 7, is it 19 by 19? 17 by 7, some prime number by some prime number of options. Just black and white, squares, just certain inputs. And you just keep telling it when it's won a game and when it's lost a game. It will start at random and it will lose so many times so many times i will say the first rules it will try will be something like always put down a square next to the the previous square and that'll make it lose um and then it'll try a rule like never put a piece down next to the other piece and that'll make it lose until eventually it loses enough times with these solid rules that it'll start trying to make up middle ground paths where it'll say, well, if you're surrounded, try something else. And if you do this for millions of iterations, eventually the, the um, strategies that the machine will produce, that the network will produce, will be very, very subtle to the point where even the programmer won't know why it made the certain um, moves that it did. Hopefully that example makes it a little easier. Okay. So important in this was backpropagation, being able to tell us um, the results being a loss, right? You lose a game of Go. Being able to tell the system that you lost the game of Go. And so the system can correct the, the most recent move, right? Oh, I shouldn't have put my piece there. But unless that was a spectacular blunder, most of the time you lost well before what was going before the um, the final event. So you have to back propagate, right? So you have to go back uh, well earlier uh, uh, to your loss, well before your loss, and figure out what adjustments to make, and do this again and again and again. You're going to be making millions of iterations of these 
before you you figure out um, which units to adjust so that you lose fewer and fewer times. So the algorithm is going to try to um, calculate what nodes were doing what and adjust the weights of all of the hidden units to figure out which units were responsible and how much. There's some problems here, uh, namely that this is, seems like it works well in math, but actually it, take, it could go on forever. Millions of iterations of the game of Go before uh, AlphaGo became good at Go. It won't always win, it won't always come to a solution. So you might um, imagine that AlphaGo would have just imagined some small modifications to its, its movement patterns, whereas really it just needed to try to, to swing for the fences, to try much different strategies. Um, it'll get to local, to, to solutions that seem obvious compared to like slightly different solutions, but, but not much, much better alternatives that are very different. And finally, there's no real evidence that this takes place in biology. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, hopefully that wasn't as as murky as it seemed. This is my second time trying to record this, and I'm I'm afraid I've, I'm making it worse each time. So the next two, the next video will focus on the remainder of this.